Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. My name is Camden Busey, and this is episode number 740. And we're back, finally, with another Voss group. Uh, I've been a little bit on and off, and we haven't been back into the book, Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments, since, I think, November. So our apologies there. Yeah, we missed December. And then we did a a sermon in January and we missed February. But anyway, you heard we have with us Lane Tipton, who is a a professor or a faculty member here, a fellow, that's the right word, fellow of biblical and systematic theology here at Reformed Forum, one of our key teachers, and he serves as pastor at Trinity OPC in Easton, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Lane. It's good to see you on the computer. We just had you in studio, though, and we'll have you back again next month. I can't wait. Uh, it was a wonderful time in studio, and as always, I'm I'm thrilled to be back uh, via via computer. Yeah, we're working feverishly. I'm halfway finished with editing the third course in the Van Til curriculum. Of course, we have our Fellowship of Reformed Apologetics, uh, where we have eight courses on Van specifically on Van Til that are um, in the works. Uh, we just filmed the third one. And that was on the Doctrine of Revelation. The first two are up and available. The first is an introduction to the theology and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til. And that basically serves as a preview of all the subsequent courses. And then the second was on Van Til's Trinitarian Theology. Van Til's Trinitarian Theology has a companion book, which is, uh, you know, the, the transformation and improvement of Lane's dissertation. So he's been working on this for 15 years plus. And uh, it's to the printer. It's out of our hands. We don't have it anymore. So we're waiting on our printer to uh, finish printing. It's going to be a beautiful hardcover. We love the we love the cover, the dust jacket. We're going to have really neat little fo- foiling on it. And there'll be more news and information about that book as it comes out. It's, it's taking a lot longer than we thought uh, because of COVID supply chain issues and, and uh, the price and, and uh, crunch on the supply of paper book paper specifically there's there's some oddities going on but we're we're on it <laughs> we should have a uh, a uh, suggested release date soon um i'll probably get in trouble with rob mckenzie who's taken over our publishing side of things here he works for us um but i'm hoping i'm hoping uh mid mid to late july we'll see We'll see where it's at. If it could get here by General Assembly, I'll be overjoyed, but I don't know if that's happening. So anyway, Lane, what do you think about the book? I'll give you a minute to to comment because I know you're pretty pretty stoked about it too. Well, I am excited about <laughs> it. Uh, I, I, I really uh, am thankful that the Lord through Reform Forum gave me time to spend r- radically reworking every sentence and uh, rewriting the dissertation uh, entirely to be honest with you, and bringing it to a kind of mature uh, expression. Uh, I've also got to say this. I love the dust jacket. (laughs) It's it's really beautiful. And so I I am uh, am pleased with the, 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 uh, and thankful for the opportunity to, to, to bring it to its full fruition and to be happy with what I wrote. Uh, but really think the aesthetic is something. And so thank you and, and, uh, all who were involved in working on those details, because I, I just, I, I love the look. I really yeah. do. I think it's, uh, it's beautiful actually. Well, I, I always say what we do here, we try to have our books and publications, even the audio and video quality, um, as best we can to to match in aesthetic quality what we hope would be the editorial and the, the quality of the content. So your book is superb. I think I have no doubt this is a book that will continue to be read 50 and maybe even 100 years from now, uh, not only because of its uh, faithful historical theology in uncovering Van Til's actual Trinitarian theology, not just the superficial things people say about it, uh, but then uncovering the polemical context out of which Van Til's doctrine arose and his confessional tradition. So connecting Van Til and linking him into a line uh, of many people, but especially, you know, Augustine, and then uh, of most importance, uh, Calvin, and then to more recent days, Herman Bovink. And as we've been saying, you know, Bovink is the 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 nom de jour, and uh, in many ways, rightly so. Uh, but but uh, people love Bavink, but all of a sudden, you know, 
still don't like Van Til's doctrine of the Trinity. Well, you're going to find out. <laughs> There's a lot of similarity. And what Van Til is doing is uh, is absolutely, I think, a proper development um, on, on a lot of uh, Orthodox, Reformed, Trinitarian theology. So we're going to have lots of copies of that, and uh, we're going to have news on that. So why don't you register for our email newsletter? You'll be the first to find out. Head on over to uh, reformedforum.org. You can find uh, registration links uh, on the website where you can sign up for the email. One more thing to announce before we get into the book. Uh, I do encourage you to visit us online at reformedforum.org slash donate. I haven't been mentioning that uh, a whole lot recently, but uh, I encourage you because we're overwhelmingly supported by listeners and viewers. I mean, we give away all of our video curriculum for free. That comes at pretty substantial expense to us to produce and distribute and get everything translated. Um, and, you know, the book sales uh, are not much of a profit <laughs> at all. And that's somewhat by design. But we rely on a, on a wide range and a, and a network, really, just an amazing community of people that support us uh, anywhere from a couple dollars a month or just a couple dollars one-time gift up to rather, you know, large and sizable amounts as well. But they're all important. Uh, I've got a goal for our organization, and, and we're really trying to put our attention toward connecting uh, really well and better with our specifically our monthly sustaining donors at any amount. And uh, we have a little bit of a, an incentive to do this other than to con- continue to see the work go forward and grow, we hope. And just uh, the good feeling you get to, to give back and to uh, promote something that you care about. But uh, we've got a little private chat server as well. So we, we never really got along too well on Facebook. We don't like that. Just open Twitter is fun. I enjoy that, especially, you know, in the in the later hours of the evening when I'm watching a basketball or a football game and I'm a little unguarded, I'll toss a tweet out. But um, we want to promote healthy conversation among people who really care about our mission. And uh, that is to present every person mature in Christ, to support the church and her work of doing that. And people who are largely old school Presbyterians concerned about redemptive historical theology, uh, particularly refracted through Voss and Van Til and others. So we've created kind of a little private environment. We're using the Discord app. Now, I don't like the name of that at all, and it's it's antithetically uh, opposed to what we're trying to promote, but... It's such a wonderful app, and a lot of other organizations and people use it as well. It's really convenient, and uh, it affords for good conversation. So we have a private Discord server, and if folks would like to be part of that, we're we're opening it up and providing invitations to all of our donors. Uh, we're not, you know, it, it has nothing to do with amount or anything like that. But this is just a convenient, pragmatic kind of way for us to to see if you actually care, rather than people that are. It's easy for people to just toss their two cents in, and you, you know how it is on theological boards where the trolls come about, and it's, it's the worst. So we have this private chat, and we're trying to grow it. We have a lot of people in there. We've already sent uh, invitations, private invitation links to all of our donors on file. Uh, but if you'd like to get in and you'd like to uh, to chat with us and got some theological questions or just want to encourage us or be encouraged, uh, not just us. When I say us, I don't mean me and Lane. I mean not even just people that work at Reform Forum, but I'm talking about the whole community. We just got a wonderful group of people who just would like if they could just live at my house. But <laughs> the next best thing is that they would go to my church. And the third best thing would be that they could I could chat with them whenever I want online. So we're also looking at uh, scheduling private events on there. Uh, you can have an audio video lounge and a uh, little online events in, in different rooms in the Discord server. So if that kind of thing is interesting to you, I really encourage you, just a little bit of an incentive, uh, visit us online at reformedforum.org slash donate. And uh, pledge your support. Help us out. Help us to continue to do this work to advance our curriculum and and to spread what we believe is this faithful and, and good and true theology to people around the world and support the church in that way. All right. Well, I'll stop there. Lane, you know, we talk a lot. We've had a long private chat room for years, uh, along with some of our other colleagues. And uh, the general chat, you get some interesting things in there, but I'd love to see a lot more names and faces of people to talk. 
And well, uh, it would hopefully, be delightful. It would be. Hopefully, we could even have follow ups when an episode comes out. We have a, an episode chat. So today we're we're talking about uh, Voss's book, Biblical Theology, Old and New Testaments. We come to page two seventy three. We left off on page two sixty nine last time, um, and we and we we can maybe just provide a comment about what was what Voss was addressing. But he went through several more passages that covered the same basic point. We're talking about revelation in the period of the prophets, but today we come to this topic, uh, this heading, social sin regarding the prophets and social sin. Lane, I don't know, is it worth, could you mention maybe just a, a little bit of a catch-up, a thumbnail sketch of our, of our last couple episodes, just so people know where we're at and why we're going to talk about social sin today? Sure, let me frame it. Um, and I, I want everyone to appreciate something. We spent time going through text after text after text after text that deals with the corruption of ritual worship. Yes. Here's why we did it. Calvinists take sin seriously, and sin has the effect of destroying the worship of God. That's what it does most basically. And so I know that it might have been a bit tiring for some to keep looking at texts that talk about the corruption of ritual worship, the despising of the glory of God in worship. But we did that, and the last few verses that we were going to look at were simply reiterating that point from specific texts in order to cement in our minds that sin ruptures the redemptive relation between God and his people, unrepentant, long-term, recalcitrant sin ruptures the religious bond of fellowship that God enters into redemptively. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're going to do today, just by way of brief preview, we're going to cover uh, pages 273 to 286 and get to the eschatology of the restoration and perfection of the redemptive relation and the coming of the Messiah. And Voss starts here with social sin. And, um, you know, uh, Camden, it, when he talks about social sin, um, it's it's a. I guess we should say we're becoming accustomed to this. I think Voss stuns us because <laughs> typically, it, when you talk about social sin and you get to this section, this is where the social justice warriors come out and begin drawing one to one correlations between Israel and modern society. And Voss says up front that caution is necessary. Due to the fact that the situation in Israel and the situation in our modern social and economic realm is widely different. Um, and, And that's a kind of counterintuitive way to begin addressing this. But Voss is starting with the point that the the theocracy in its old covenant, earthly, shadowed down, provisional, typical form bears a host of discontinuities with nations in our present 20th and now 21st century context. And um, he, he starts with kind of an obvious one, and then he moves into the heart of the matter uh, after he starts with the more or less obvious historical context. But here, here it is. He says, first of all, before you try to draw any kind of one-to-one correlation between Israel and states today, Let's just say the United States today to make it concrete. Yeah, for sure. He says he says that modern society is commercial and industrial in character. Uh, by commercial, Voss simply means that uh, that the society seeks to produce a commodity it's that business. promotes personal wealth. Yeah, business, yeah. business, business. Uh, by in- <laughs> yeah, business. Uh, and by industrial, he means the mass production of. Uh, of a product in a factory yeah. uh, that that's aimed at at creating wealth. Mm-hmm. It's business. Sure. And his point, this first one is a is a very basic one, but he's saying that the that relation of capital to labor that marks industrial commercial nations today in a kind of post-industrial revolution world, it just didn't exist with Israel. And so he's he's saying that this this should not we should not think going in that there is a kind of univocal or one to one correspondence uh, between Israel and nations today and what that means is very helpful a lot of times 
you can find liberals or conservatives looking for a blueprint. Yes, I know. Often liberals are saying, I need a blueprint for social justice so we can right all the wrongs in our society by applying univocally all of these prophetic pronouncements. Sometimes with um, conservatives, instead of social justice, it might be something like absolute truth or unchanging norms by which we can measure sin and so on. Or we build, fa- build an entire governmental structure off the phrase general equity from yes. the Westminster Confession of Faith. Yes. Uh, so it can go kind of both ways. It could mm-hmm. that general equity clause that some liberals can the the liberalizing trend is to make it a social justice quest, right. and the conservative or theonomic trend is to to build an entire governmental structure off of this the 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 law and the prophets. And Voss is saying something like this that that the theocracy is not a normative model to be seamlessly applied into our contemporary context. And that's because the theocracy, and it kind of moves to the second point, that that theocracy is not first and foremost an expression of timeless ethical principles for social and economic prosperity. The theocracy, if we think back to what Voss said earlier, is an intrusion of the age to come, an intrusion of the perfected state at the end of the age, and a redemptive relation between Jehovah and Israel that expresses itself in worship. And so Voss is saying that's the the paramount central concern with the theocracy. It's, It's not a blueprint for social ethics. It's an intrusion of the glory of the age to come in a provisional, typical, redemptive covenant. So so I think that's really, uh, I guess our Voss listeners, those those who are reading along with us and have listened to Voss Group, won't be so surprised. But once again, Voss continues with that central concern about the worship of the Lord and the um, uniqueness of the theocracy as an intruded holy realm right. that reveals but veils the glory of the age to come. And that's mm-hmm. that's an all-controlling principle for Voss. Yeah, it is. I This is what the value of, of studying redemptive historical theology is and why Voss uh, is so helpful, at least to me. We're frequently drawn back to the big picture, but not without without compromising, I should say, the the details. So the big picture, uh, God is establishing a, a religious bond with us. I mean, we were created that way. Uh, you know, Adam was created in positive religious fellowship with a religious bond with God. And then he was given uh, the covenant of works, of course. He failed and we received the covenant of grace, which attains uh, the original promise of life that was offered to Adam in that first covenant. And so the whole structure here where the critics want to pull everything apart and look at details and deconstruct. Uh, They will interpret uh, social sin and uh, they'll interpret ritual corruption and ritual worship in different ways and try to put the prophets at odds with the worship system, so to speak. Uh, Voss is so insistent always to remind us in this section, as elsewhere, of how the entire Israelite economy, and I don't mean just commerce, just relations of all societal components. That entire economy is is based upon and revolves around a relationship with God, a religious relationship. Um, that's why God, you know, was present among them in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, and he was present there in the most holy place, and everything was around that, and God was leading them unto their rest, and then eventually in the temple. That was the the location of God's presence. But now things have changed. Not The big picture hasn't changed at all. But that typological symbol, those typological um, types, uh, have now yielded to something much greater where the Holy Spirit dwells among us as a people himself. So we don't have to have the, the visible marker. So that's just the big picture here. But Voss is is keenly aware of all of the uh, historical developments, but I love how he situates them here and how he interacts directly with the critics, Velhausen and others, uh, to to demonstrate how they just get things incorrectly. 
And there are yeah, a whole he, host of people that do, not just the critics, but you mentioned uh, liberals and progressives, political American progressives, as well as as theonomists. They misunderstand yes. the purpose of the typological arrangement in the very beginning. Yeah, and and one of the things on page two seventy four, Camden, uh, as we're now for our listeners. This is warp speed nine, if you want to use a Star Trek analogy. Uh, we're really moving on now. But on, on page 274, Voss says this, that, um, and this is so insightful, mm. building on that very point you made, that, that the prophetic condemnation of social sin in Israel, quote, does not have its deepest root in humanitarian motives. You're right. I need to back that, up, though, because I think you jumped over something that's enormous, uh, at yeah. least for a certain type of person. Yeah, let me hear. Because it. in the yeah. <laughs> you're going to either roll your eyes or you're going to get real excited. But um, so in in uh, conservative Presbyterian circles, there's always this conversation about the city. We got to redeem the no, city. Yeah. We got to build. Yeah. <laughs> we got to, you know, mission yeah. to the city. And there, there's this loose idea that um, well, because we begin in a garden. And we end in a city, the New Jerusalem. There, there tends to be this implication. Sometimes it's just said that the city is somehow more holy and a more prized type of ministry. Okay, Voss says in exceptional cases, perhaps what may be called the problem of the city. Amos and especially Micah recognize that the city, while an accumulator of the energies of culture, is also an accumulator of potencies of evil. That that would be a great name for a old-timey WWF tag team. <laughs> the potencies of evil. I love it. You get the powers of pain, demolition, <coughs> legion of doom before them, obviously oh. road wars, but potencies of yes. evil. In the capital, all evil is concentrated. Hence, in the future, all cities will have to cease to exist. <laughs> Uh-oh. Yes. Malik- Micah 210, 38 through 12, 49, 13, That's 510, huge. and 13. But here's here's the thing that kicked it for me. I was like, well, of course, but the, the New Jerusalem is a city. So come on, course, boss. Yeah. But then he says, and this is what got me, men shall then sit in rural simplicity and security, each under his own vine and fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. The Messianic king will not proceed from the city of Jerusalem, but from the country town of Bethlehem as David did originally. Now there is the new city of Jerusalem. That is a, an image. I don't sure. think we need to get too literalistic or read into these these images too much. But um, I like what he's saying there. Often the cities throughout the Bible are depicted as not great places. And uh, redemptive historically, it's interesting to see how they interact here with social sin. And that's something that Voss puts his, his finger on right here in this chapter. Yeah, it, and and if we relate this to some of the earlier uh, material in the biblical theology, of uh, which Camden, th- very good to stop and make sure we we make this point because I was going to move on. I was getting into panoramic <laughs> overview mode and was about to move on, but um, the, if Daryl Hart was on the program. This this would be four hours just on that. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. The the propensions of Lamech, the the desire that Babel, finds dude. its expression in Babel, right. where a, a ziggurat tower is made to the name and glory and extension mm-hmm. of the city of man. Sodom. And mm-hmm. and then the, the Lord brings judgment on that, descends and scatters. And out of that, right. he calls Abraham and promises him um, a city to come. And I think, I think what Voss is saying here um, uh, is that when you look at the biblical theology of the city, you have to recognize its concentration of evil as a as a kind of incubator for the bestial propensions of of Satan, um, and and the um, and and that theme that he brings out and the the passages that you cite, I think, are wonderful reminders that the the home of the believer. And the holiness of the believer is not associated with that earthly city, that uh, right. with the Babylonite proportions, but with the city that God has built and reserved for yeah. His people, and that will be unveiled when it descends and envelops and transforms and conforms all things on earth and the righteous to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's it, yeah. One it, thing it's, that it's a beautiful thing. The city is not 
wicked in and of itself as a social structure. I mean, the problem right. is that it's a it's a concentration of sinners <laughs> in a city that makes it a problem. And so the transformation that needs to happen uh, to redeem the city, you don't redeem a city, people are redeemed, uh, yeah. souls are redeemed. Yeah. But uh, the group of people that will remain in the new Jerusalem, uh, it will be a good place. It's also a place of security, uh, a place yeah. where everyone has their own fig tree, you know, yep. um, and no one takes away from them. They enjoy yeah. the fruits of their own labors. Yeah. That happens because of transformation. So I think I put this one, I put, if we're, if we're stacking white marbles and black marbles for the transformation or to, for, uh, for continuity or discontinuity in the eschaton, I, I personally would put this one as a marble in the discontinuity category, but we'll see. Yeah, well, and the banner that flies is that Israel and the covenant people, page 274, must trust in Jehovah, not in its own strength, not in its own attainments, right. not in its own walls and ramparts and defenses. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's Amen. that's beautiful. Now, in light of that. Okay, where are we and, at here and, at the bottom of that, 274, right? I, and, and still on page 274. Right. Last paragraph. Uh, the, yeah, in the last paragraph, the prophetic condemnation of social sin of Israel does not have its deepest root in humanitarian motives. Now, this is really simple, and I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time on this because it's so basic to everything that Voss says, but his point is that social justice is not a humanitarian end in itself. It is not the main or central priority. Social, social justice is subordinate to and is the overflow of the priority of the worship and service of God. Um, and I think Voss is anticipating or expressing here what comes to be expressed in kingdom of God and the church, that the kingdom and the relation between Israel and God is not first and foremost social in nature, but religious in nature. So the injustice is sin against God, um, privileging the rich or persecuting the poor, abusing economic power is first and foremost rebellion against God and a denial of the theocratic principle where the whole life is, in, is suffused with the worship of God, ordered toward God, concerned about God's glory. And the thing that makes injustice so odious in the nostrils of the prophets is not first and foremost its inhumanity, but first and foremost that it is injurious of the glory of God. It is uh, striking out against God. And so uh, I think that insight is extremely useful when we think about social justice because the great majority of those discussions are what I would call obsessed, to use Voss's language, with the social organism and have no concern about the purity of the worship of the living and true God in Christ Jesus. And it, it, it's just a wonderful reminder, I think, that Voss gives us about that point. And it's a timely one, I think. Yeah, absolutely. So, what are we dealing with here where Voss starts to argue with uh, that the typical economic practice was suspended within the theocracy? Um, what is he talking about? Well, I think what he's what he's getting at is that – and he, he gives an example of this um, on pages uh, – on when he quotes uh, – makes an allusion to Leviticus 25.35 – He's, he argues that no interest could be taken from an Israelite, yet it could be taken uh, from a foreigner. Um, in other words, he's saying that outside of Israel, a common and possibly uh, a standard practice was the taking of interest on the giving of money. But he says that what would be allowed on pure economic grounds is forbidden on theocratic grounds because a higher rule exists for the people of God than that of economic rightness per se. And when he when he looks at the text uh, from the Decalogue, Leviticus twenty five thirty five is a main one. The reason why you're not to um, charge interest to a brother um, is that you are to fear God and that your brother may live beside you. Why? Well, 
to put it basically and not to become too repetitive, the theocracy is not a commercial enterprise aimed at profit. The theocracy is an intrusion of the kingdom in its perfected form where brother dwells with brother in the worship and service of God as a kingdom of priests, as a royal nation, holy unto the Lord. And so Voss is saying once again that the principle that drives the theocracy, the principle that conditions its ethic, is that you have an intruded, glorified realm to come in earthly typical forms, and each is to worship and serve God side by side yeah. in a common bond of fellowship as those who've been brought out of Egypt and who are devoted to the worship and service of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And and I, I think that's what he's after when he talks about the higher rule existing for the people of God than economic rightness. Yeah, you see that uh, toward the top of page 276 as well, where, uh, uh, and you've commented, you know, we have a distinguishing uh, between a proper prophetic denunciation and the social gospel. Mm -hmm. and what is important is that the prophets are always pointing people back toward the worship of God, which is why idolatry comes up so much. What is the main problem that the prophets are often talking about? It's about their false worship, but also their social sin, but the social sin is not primary. I mean, I'm, it, it's, it's important, but let's think about the two great commandments that Jesus distills all the law down into, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Both are important, but the loving your neighbor as yourself has to come as an outflow, and it's and it in a sense is is uh, regulated by or directed by our love for God and our relation to God. We can't ever love our neighbor if we don't love God. That's oddly enough a, a key insight of Karl Rahner, but <laughs> he has he has other things going on. But um, this is why uh, Voss is so helpful here to say that when the prophets are pointing out social or societal issues, it's in, always in conjunction with idolatry and worship. Yeah. It's not as, uh, the horizontal on its own. It's first and foremost a vertical dimension that has horizontal implications. Yeah, on the, on the top of 276, uh, first full paragraph there, or first, yeah, first full paragraph, he says, the prophets view the facts, and he's talking about social sin, in their relation to God as measured by the standards of absolute ethics and religion. The modern social enthusiast views them mainly, if not exclusively, in their bearing on the welfare of man. And so, and that, that is a comprehensive, by the way, that description right there, I think is comprehensive of either liberal or conservative ethics that prioritize the welfare of man and make social and economic structures concerned with the welfare of man and divorce those structures from the worship of God. And the prophets are saying, as you've so rightly pointed out, Kenan, you cannot do that without committing the very sin that is going to lead to exile, because the sin that is going to lead to exile is cherishing the gift above the giver or the outward external blessings that are social and economic above God himself in the relation of worship and religious fellowship that comes through his, his right. covenant of grace. So it's it's easy enough to consider, think about progressive Christians. Progressive, I mean, in this, in the using the categories of American politics uh, or European. Um, you, you think of groups like Sojourners or other things like that that are typically on the lefter side of things and mainline yeah. Protestantism. Do you have any examples of this type of thinking, though, from from the conservative side, maybe even a theonomic side. Well, it, it's uh, it's this is a stunning thing, Camden. Uh, back in uh, I believe it was 1987. That's the year I became a Christian. Now that I'm thinking about it, uh, Gary North, who uh, I've I still own uh, in various places, almost everything he wrote. I I bought and read his material back uh, when I became a Christian in the late 80s. 
He has a book entitled Dominion and Common Grace. And let me just give you the thesis, and I'll give you a couple of quotes. But it's a stunning uh, uh, book for this reason. He advocates that we should ask unbelievers to attain cultural prosperity through partial obedience that comes from unregenerate hearts. And the goal for doing it, we should just be honest, is the attainment of the gifts of cultural dominion. Partial obedience yields external blessing, whether you believe in God or not. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a stunning thesis. I think I've overused that term, an, an astonishing one. Listen to what he says. I'll give you a couple of quotes from pages 173 and then 176 and 77. He says, a theology that is orthodox must include a doctrine of common grace that is intimately related to biblical law. Law does not save men's souls, but partial obedience to it does save their bodies and their culture. Down on 176 and 7, the law of God is a tool of dominion. When men adhere to its principles externally, they receive God's external blessings. This common grace obedience brings external blessings, and it may also bring external influence. Now, what is so uh, surprising about this is that you wouldn't expect um, a Calvinist who has a very high doctrine of sin to say that unbelievers can mechanically bring about external blessings yeah. by partial faithless conformity to moral civil laws. Mm. But he goes so far in that volume to describe Isaiah 65, 17 through 25 about the new heavens and new earth as something that is realized at least partially through um external conformity to God's moral law so that all might enjoy outward temporary blessings. And the thing that's ironic about it, and I'm not picking on Gary North. I think this is the most problematic thing he ever argued, and uh, but it shows where his theonomic uh, hermeneutic led him, um, is that the problem of the theocracy is just that. <laughs> That people were offering partial, half-hearted, insincere obedience to God and prioritized the cultural and social benefits above God himself. And in fact, exchanged the worship and service of the creator for the accumulation of material goods and financial prosperity. They exchanged worship for influence and affluence in the land. And so I think um, it's, it's really a, a surprising thing for a Reformed theologian to make that sort of claim because he's, A, saying something very hard to distinguish from more traditional social, social gospel approaches, where it's, we're just trying to make the conditions of our uh, social and economic status better, but it's also, and I think more ironically, it's the polar far side of what Voss is saying. And it's actually, if we compared North to Voss on this, North would be advocating behavior that caused Israel's exile because it was not behavior appropriate to the worship and service of God and the priority of his glory and the enjoyment of his presence. So it's a, it's a real stunning yeah, uh, no. I think there might that. be. I haven't read the book, so I don't know this whole argument in context. At least, if he's speaking in terms of contemporary issues, like doing this today, uh, so there's no possibility of retention of you know typological land blessings. Or the, we're not going to get exiled. You know, we'll get judged. But is he is he maybe also saying uh, something like? Uh, well, in general, if you do things that God wants, I mean, it'll go better for you, even if you're not doing them for the right reasons or you don't have a regenerate heart. If you don't kill your unborn children, your society will be better off. If you don't, you know, allow for people to steal from one another, generally you'll have, you'll prosper better. <laughs> yeah, is it's, it, is it's it, more radical than it's, that. I, Actually, I figure it here, is. I'll give you the I'll give you the broader. I don't yeah. want to get lost on North because this book of all the books he wrote when I was younger, this one fascinated me the most. 
And I knew intuitively it was just not right, but didn't know until, you know, a few years exactly how to critique it. He's saying that, A, this stores up wrath for them because they're doing things that they know bring success for them in history, but they're doing it in rebellion against God. And so it stores up wrath for them. So this temporal prosperity is actually something that's storing up wrath for the unbeliever. But secondly, and this is the more radical character of the claim, he's not just saying, you know, generally it's going to go better for you if you don't steal and kill. That's been said by hundreds and you know thousands <laughs> which, of people. Which is true enough. Um, but... <laughs> yeah, which is a truism. North is saying that this is actually the mechanism by which the golden age on earth is realized. Yeah, that's a major problem. And, yeah, yeah. and so, so for him, I would call it a kind of. Uh, this is a, a little harsh, but it'll make my point. It it you it's it's a thesis that is um, forged toward a utopian end of a millennial kingdom, a time of unprecedented prosperity. Now Christians get both. This is a strange way of putting it, but Christians get both the spiritual blessings and the cultural blessings. But when all the people on earth recognize how prosperous it is to uh, obey and be blessed with temporal, financial, cultural blessings, they will do it. And as they do it, it will be the mechanism through which the golden age is realized right. progressively on earth. And dominion comes and the prophecy of Isaiah 65 right. comes to its earthly fulfillment. Yeah. And the new heavens, the new earth. That's what that chapter is about. There's no, yep. in my opinion, no exegetical... Uh, transition or contrast between a millennial kingdom and the new heavens oh. and the new earth in that chapter, but I'm sure I'll get emails about that. But how does well, Voss? Sorry, then... I, don't, I don't mean to. I don't mean to get too no many about emails, what I just it... said. Uh, oh, well. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, okay. How does Voss then transition as he we start looking? You know, from pages 276 through 286. Um, not just speaking about social sin, but then starting to consider some of the theological themes of restoration and uh, eschatology. Uh, what are yeah. what are some of the proper ways to think about this transition and, and how does Voss arrive at them or at least lay the framework or the foundation for them through the doctrines of sin that are presented by Hosea and, uh, and Isaiah, for example? Yeah. Well, this is where we're going to make up some ground and uh, cover the material fairly comprehensively but quickly. Uh, when, when Voss transitions to the discussion of A, Hosea's doctrine of sin, B, Isaiah's doctrine of sin, and C, Israel's sin viewed historically, what we need to understand is this uh, as, a, as a first major point. Hosea and Isaiah's theology of sin help us see by contrast what the new covenant will bring about so that uh, with Hosea. What is sin, according to Hosea? It is a breach of the marriage bond. Sin is rebellion against God as a husband. God and his people and the loyalty that's to characterize the religious devotion to God has been forfeited. So Hosea is saying Israel lacks faithfulness to the Lord and are marked by betrayal and treachery toward God. Uh, they consider God and his statutes a, a strange thing, 812. And they, they therefore treat as profane what God has called holy, and they have lost all sense of not only religious devotion to God, but the delight that God gives to his bride as a husband. And, and, and so instead of delighting in the covenant relation to God, 411 on page 277, he says they have engaged in whoredom. And, and what is the whoredom on page 277 consist of, especially, this is a golden quote, the people care only for the gifts and are indifferent to the giver. If the Apostle Paul translated that, he would say they have come to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator in the, in the context of Hosea, rather than the Redeemer, the Lord of the Covenant. And so what, what have they done? They've prior, and this connects to social sin. They have so prioritized the temporal and the cultural, the quest for external benefits, that they have valued those gifts in such a way that they are indifferent to, and if indifferent, actually hostile 
toward God. And so the coming of the Spirit in the New Covenant, first point, is going to be a reversal of this whoredom that values the gift rather than the giver. And what will come when this redemptive relation is restored and perfected in the coming of the Spirit is that the church will be marked by those who value the giver over the gifts, the creator over the creature, the redeemer over anything in the fallen eon. And and so that way of thinking about it, when you think about Hosea's doctrine of sin, the, the coming of the new covenant, the eschatology of restoration and consummation, it's going to reverse that very point. And in, in the place of infidelity, treachery will be fidelity and um, a devotion to the Lord that comes from the heart. And so um, when we think of it that way, Hosea's doctrine of sin helps us see by contrast what the new covenant is going to look like. Because we're now we're moving toward that restorative, consummative movement where that uh, fruition of God and his covenant people. And um, secondly, and briefly here, for Isaiah, sin is not his his conception of sin is not so much used in terms of the marriage metaphor but the glory of god is is um denied voss says we probably have in isaiah the deepest conception of the nature of sin anywhere in the old testament and he says that that sin in its essence is idolatry and a caricature of religion in general dishonoring to God and exchanging the living God, here's the key, for something manufactured by themselves. So um, that can range from idols carved in wood or stone to a deity fashioned by the mind of man. Isaiah 57, 15 reminds us God is high and exalted. He inhabits eternity and as such dwells with the one who is contrite and lowly. Instead of being intoxicated with that glory of that infinitely exhaust, exalted God, the Israel became intox, intoxicated not only with wine, but with false religion and idolatry. And so what, what's going to come in the new covenant to offset that? Believers are going to worship the living and true, exalted and infinite holy and immutable triune God in the Messiah. Not only is there going to be a reversal where there's loyalty in terms of this husband-wife relation, but there's going to be a proper understanding of who God is, not idols uh, developed or manufactured by hands or minds, but God as he is revealed in scripture, the living and true, infinite and eternal, immutable and self-contained triune God. That is the God who condescends in Christ to save his people. And so th those two features are going to be kind of, if I could put it this way, kind of linchpins that undergird the coming of the true religion when the spirit of the Messiah is poured out on the church in the new covenant. Mm -hmm. And 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 it's just a, a wonderful way of of I think understanding why uh, how and why Hosea's and Isaiah's doctrine of sin start to shed light on what's going to come in restoration and redemption and the perfecting of this relationship. Absolutely, yeah. The focus is not upon social transformation first and foremost. That's a that's tangential or subsidiary uh, concern that comes to the renewal of and perfection of our religious fellowship, which is the whole point from the very beginning. That's what was offered to Adam in the covenant of works, that he would advance to a higher estate, a glorious yeah. mode of life to be present with the Lord in the highest heavens. And uh, you can compare all sorts of passages on this, but two I would name, 1 Corinthians 15, the mode of life that that are, is compared there to that of the resurrected Christ is Adam as created— but even if you don't agree with that or won't won't follow our exegesis on that, just look at the symbolism of the tree of life. 
the tree of life is present in Revelation 2, 7, Revelation 22 at least, but also in 21 there's indication there. Might be getting some of my verses mixed up. But it appears again in the eschaton, and the reason is to show us that this is not merely a return to the garden, because as the tree of life reappears, now it extends. It's so large it's on both sides of the river, and it bears 12 kinds of fruits each and every month, all the time. So there's no time in which it's not fruitful. It's a prophetic idiom. It's, a, it's an example that this is the life that was offered in the garden, but it's so much greater than the life that they had. Uh, and so there's organic unity, but yet consummation and surpassing. Hey, hey. Amen. And on that point of unity, I'm so glad you said organic unity because it reminded mm-hmm. me of something. Uh, just so uh, we can we can do chapter and verse here. On page 282, when Voss is talking about the sin of Israel, and as we're moving to page 286 and following about restoration and consummation, moving toward the new covenant, I want to make a, uh, a comment here that I think is extremely useful. And I encourage listeners to review the wonderful discussion that you and Carlton and Will had on Jeremiah 31. I think that I thought that was just a fantastic uh, discussion. Here's what's key. The old covenant is not in, intrinsically devoid of this religious devotion to God and worshiping him as he has revealed himself as the self-contained uh, creator and savior. Um, in fact, Voss says on page 282 under points A and B that the alpha point of this relationship in the Exodus um, that that the prophets are speaking of and the breach of the of the covenant was a relatively perfect and pure beginning of Israel's religion in Revelation. In other words, let me put it in some dogmatic language that might help. God entered into a bona fide covenant of grace with Israel as a nation. And that religious fellowship, that that bringing Israel to God on the wings of an eagle, uh, to see his glory on Mount Sinai, to see his glory in the tabernacle, that is a um, the, the substance of that relation is the covenant of grace. It is a proleptic, anticipatory partaking of Christ through promises, types, and sacrifices that both typify his coming but mediate his saving presence through the Spirit. Voss also says in B that that, that uh, was almost immediately Israel began falling away from that. So what is the new covenant going to do? What is this coming of the Messiah, this restoration and consummation uh, in Christ going to do? Well, it's going to restore and bring about the eschatological perfecting of that redemptive relation. So it's it's a movement from a very good redemptive relation coming out of Egypt, fulfilling the Abrahamic promises in the back of that Adam and Noah. It's fulfilling that. Um, and and uh, in continuity with that, but it's bringing it to its full maturation and consummation in Jesus Christ. And so as the Spirit inscribes the law of God on the heart, brings about fidelity to the covenant, clarifies for the minds of the people of God about who God is. He's not a mutable idol. He's not a correlative mutualistic construction. He is the living and true God. He's the right. one exalted above all, condescended to dwell with his people, immutable person, uh, dwell, persons dwelling with, with the, the, yeah. the people of God in the incarnate Christ glorified. That's the, that's the restoration and the perfection of that relation into which God entered with Israel as a nation on Mount Sinai, um, as he brought them out of Egypt. So Voss, I think, the point Voss makes, I believe, is a wonderful confirmation of the insights that you and Carlton and Will had on that Jeremiah 31 discussion, and just another confirmation of the what I would call the triumph of redemptive organism yeah, in the theology of Gerhardus Voss. 
Yeah, just to put a point on it, is is what happens at Sinai with Moses entirely devoid of Christ, perfectly based on works. Even if it only has a, even if someone who says that is saying, well, it only has to do with external blessings. No, come on, guys. I mean, just read the beginning of the Ten Commandments. It's based on grace. The covenant that God establishes with Moses is an administration of the covenant of grace. Christ is at the heart of it. Substance language might be difficult for some people to understand or not, or they may just not agree with those constructs, but this is the way our tradition is spoken. And the substance, the guts, if I want to talk to maybe like a farmer, the fabric and the guts of the covenant with Moses is none other than Jesus. It's a good thing. It's not retrograde. They should, they wouldn't have been better off if they told Moses and the Lord, thanks, but no thanks. We like our arrangement with Abraham. That's nonsense. Yeah. It would be denying the organic right. and progressive movement uh, toward the new heavens and new earth in union with the ascended Christ. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. A lot more to say on, on that. You can go back to our previous episodes and discussions on uh, Moses re- in Voss Group. So, Head on over to reformedforum.org. If you go to the menu, you'll see Christ the Center under podcasts. And then under Christ the Center, there's Voss Group and Van Til Group. We hope to get back to the Van Til Group soon, but you can go back and view all the archives of Voss Group from the very beginning, uh, many, many years ago. Once again, thank you so much for listening and watching. I encourage you to go online to our website, reformedforum.org slash donate. Just a reminder, all of our donors will receive uh, a private invitation link to come join our, our online community where we chat. And we are going to be having some uh, events, some, you know, just conversations where you can drop in to a conference call and just talk. Uh, we already have a, a virtual lounge there where people can join and somebody else can pop in and you can, you know, have a meetup or talk theology or do whatever you'd like to do. And uh, also, hopefully, going to be having some events in there where maybe we'll have, you know, like a little book club or something like that, a topic of discussion and have a scheduled time and say, you know, at 8 p.m. on such and such date, we'll be talking about this article from this journal. Join us. And let's have a conversation, kind of that social audio thought that you are seeing in Clubhouse and on, on Twitter, for example, except we want to uh, promote this community of like-minded people. So we're keeping it closed at the moment, but it's, but it's there for you if you'd like to jump in. Just head on over to reformedforum.org slash donate. Join our community if you got any issues with that or questions, send us a note through email. I do thank everybody for listening and watching, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.